July 7, 2004. My name is Janet Palmer, and I'm interviewing Mr. Patrick Edwin Golden. He goes by the name Eddie for the Veterans History Project at the Atlanta History Center. Uh, Mr. Golden, would you please uh, spell your name and give me your birth date? Um, my name is Eddie Golden, G-O-L-D-E-N. My birth date is March 19, 1921. And, and what branch of the service were you in? Uh, United States Army. And what rank did you attain? The First highest? Lieutenant. What was your serial number? Uh, 0470938. And where did you serve primarily? In the European Theater. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, first we want to start out just to give get a little background about your family life and your life <clears throat> and what you were doing before you went into the service. Um, what, what, where did you grow up and what did your parents do and what, do you have brothers and sisters and so on? Well, I, I was born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. Grew up in New Orleans. Uh, I, my father was in the sales end of a flint coat roofing company, and my mother was a housewife. I have one brother who is seven years younger than I, and he was in school prior when I was in college. I went to uh, the university, LSU, Louisiana State University, which was an ROTC university. And it was there that uh, I had four years of military training, plus one summer at Fort Benning, where they took all the senior cadets for six or eight weeks of military training. And I finished LSU in January of 1943. And what, what was your major? My major was petroleum engineering. And uh, I was allowed to graduate. Let me back up and say I received a commission into the Army, Army in May of 1942. And I was given a, a one semester deferment to allow me to get a degree. Uh, which I did. And then I received orders to report to the Army on February 3rd, 1943. And where did you go from, from LSU? My I first station you. was Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, which was uh, an engineer training depot. And I was there uh, approximately two months, at which time I was transferred to the 551st Heavy Ponton Battalion, which was a bridge building, floating bridge building organization. And they were at Camp Gordon at the time, right, with orders to go on Tennessee maneuvers. So in May of 43, I went on Tennessee maneuvers until August of 43. How was that <coughs> experience? Uh, well, it, I guess you could say it was just like field conditions. We did the same thing on maneuvers that we did at Fort Leonard Wood, uh, build bridges, uh, erect gin poles, and assist infantry operations. So uh, primarily did the floating bridges on maneuvers with the heavy Ponton Battalion. Are there any stories you remember from that time? Any? Anything that really stands out in your mind about any experiences? Uh, not on maneuvers. Maneuvers were pretty cut and dried. Uh, almost like a planned, uh, choreographed type of operation. The, uh, nothing unusual. Did, did you have any friends that, that from school that went into the service at the same time as you did? Uh, yes, I did, but uh, they were, most of my friends that went in at that time were in the infantry. LSU had three branches of service. They had the infantry, Corps of Engineers, and field artillery. So various seniors were called to service. Uh, I'd get there been time, but 
primarily most of them that had either finished their degrees in the June period of 1942 were called into service at that time. Uh, in fact, the, the, one of the closest friends I had was killed before I went into service mm. in Italy. Uh, that's how fast it was going at that time. Do you remember how you felt when you reported for, <laughs> for duty? Oh, I was, I was thrilled. Uh, prior to me reporting to duty, I had received these orders to go to um, Harding Field, which was an Army base, Army Air Force base in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, for my physical. So I knew that once I passed the physical, it was just a day or two later that uh, I got orders to report to Fort Leonard Wood. And Fort Leonard Wood was training new recruits. So I was a, a brand new officer training brand new recruits. But uh, it, it, was, it was a fun time until I went to the 551st and then, as I say, went on Tennessee maneuvers then. And from that point, I guess it was late August of 43, I got orders to report to Shenango, which is the uh, ship out point, debarkation point from New York to go overseas. So I was there for oh, maybe 10 days, two weeks, waiting for orders to go overseas, and I shipped out uh, around the first week of September of 43 to England. Went over on the Maritania, which was an old four-stacker cruise ship. We had uh, pipe berths, seven, seven high on that ship. But it, uh, it was a fast boat, and it didn't have any, uh, we didn't go in a convoy. And there was no need for that because it, it was a little faster than the average uh, military ship at that time. So they didn't worry about the, the uh, submarines. How was that? How was life on the ship? Well, it was hectic. I mean, life on the ship, but it was only about a four or five day trip. We went over and uh, landed in Scotland. But uh, I don't recall exactly the number we had on that boat, but I, I would think it was close to 10,000. I don't know. I, I'm just guessing here. But the uh, handling the mess and the sleeping arrangements. And uh, it, was, it was just totally packed. Did you each have your own bunk or did you have to share? No, it, it, it was a pipe berth. You know, it was, uh, if you can picture plumbing pipe made a square rack with mm -hmm. a canvas uh, mattress, mm -hmm. a one sling mattress, and sleeping seven high in there, That's, that was the, the way we went over. And what were your primary duties on the ship? I had no duties on the ship. Mm -hmm. no. the, uh, the duties were just uh, exercise, walk, and, because it was, a, it was a total replacement type of operation. Uh, we were going over as replacement, a pool, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got to England, that's when, we got, when I got assigned to the 19th District Headquarters which was located in Taunton. Now, you said you went into um, Scotland? Went into Scotland. And then how did you went yeah. to England right from there? Or we, did you stay in Scotland? No, we went, uh, I don't think I was in Scotland two days. You took the train? No, I went about a two and a half ton truck. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> they trucked us over. Oh, okay. And the, uh, as I say, I was assigned to the 19th District Headquarters uh, to the Office of the Engineer there. And there were, uh, there was a major who was the engineer and uh, a captain and myself, three officers in the district engineer's office. And my duties in that office was to investigate all of the airfields that the U.S. Air Force was going to be using to make sure that they had the, the right square footage, 
and the right number of Johns and the right number of beds. You know, they treat the Air Force like hotels. They, uh, so that was the kind of duty I drew in the beginning. And I had already applied for troop duty when, when I hit England. But uh, nonetheless, I was assigned to this 19th District Headquarters. And since they had no <coughs> officer BOQs or uh, bachelor officer quarters or any barracks, the military, we were assigned to be billeted with English families. And I happened to be billeted with a family by the name of Trenchard. He was a he was the postmaster of Taunton, and they were they were a delightful elderly couple. I I thoroughly enjoyed staying with them, living with them, and learning various uh, British slogans, so to speak. <laughs> but that uh, that was an enjoyable part of uh, being in England. And from that point, uh, I'd have to look at notes to tell you for dates. But I would, I would say I was at the headquarters from uh, September of '43 to about uh, March of '44, and at which point I was transferred to the 246 Engineer Combat Battalion who had been training in England. And I, uh, I was assigned to Company C there and made a platoon commander there. While you, while you were in Taunton, when you were staying with these people, are there anything about them that you remember in particular or any, any oh. types of things they did or, or stories about them that you remember? Well, you know, uh, Mrs. Trenchard used to say, well, what time do you want me to knock you up in the morning? You know? <laughs> I remember that vividly. And it was, uh, and they always had, uh, what do they call light tea? In the, uh, it was about supper time for us, and they had light tea. But uh, other than just normal conversation, delightful conversation, they were, <coughs> excuse me, they were very pleasant. Uh, it was just a, a good experience mm -hmm. living with an English partner, English family. Mm -hmm. And that's about as much as I can tell you on that. Mm -hmm. So then after you left there? After I left there, I was assigned <coughs> to the 246 Engineer Combat Battalion. And they were in the field. And the, the trench yards was the last bit I saw till I got back to the States. Really? Yeah. We lived in the field from throughout my time of uh, service in England, uh, training for the invasion. And training for the invasion, we were constantly being graded against other engineer battalions to determine at least we were told to determine who was going to be selected for what. You know, we were trained on underwater demolitions. We were trained on mine removal. We were trained on booby traps. We were trained on bridge building. All, all of the functions that an engineering operation performs in support of infantry. And uh, I suppose we were lucky because we, we didn't grade too well on underwater demolitions and we didn't get in the first wave. So. So that was uh, one of the more fortunate points of, um, I guess, of my experience. Mm -hmm. But we worked uh, in the air, Slapton Sands area in Torquay in England, which is a, a beach resort, kind of. And uh, we would go out in boats and come back and practice invasion tactics and this type of thing, in addition to doing field exercises. And, long marches and just good physical training. I guess I was, uh, I got to be in the best shape I was ever in and that's probably what saved a lot of us by being in good shape. Now while you were over there, were you able to get letters and hear from your family pretty regularly? Yes. Uh, well they had the, uh, what was it called again? 
It was like a photograph mail. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name. I know the name myself. But and anyway, it was you know, a letter about so big it had been photostatted and sent. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, I got packages from my mother. I was single. Mm -hmm. And uh, we communicated regularly. In fact, e even when we jumped off and we were in France, after, I guess after about the first two or three weeks, they allowed us to, uh, to write home. Mm -hmm. At least, uh, but you couldn't tell you, say too much other than I'm in France. Mm -hmm. But uh, we sailed out of Southampton at the invasion on uh, LSTs. Now, did you know where you were going and at that time? No. You didn't? No, I didn't. I knew, I, knew, I guess, uh, midway across, we knew we were going to hit Omaha Beach. But uh, we were on the water, you see, when uh, we got all this. And the fighting was already, had already taken the uh, first wave and the second wave. So when we went ashore, uh, the 29th Infantry and the 101st Airborne was already in uh, defensive positions maybe a mile and a half inland. Do you remember how you felt when you heard? Heard the first heard gunfire? That? Yes, I do, because I went ashore about 5 o'clock in the evening, and it was getting dark. And I had, uh, I was in a command car at that time with about six GIs with me. And I had been given a map prior to debarking from the ship, giving me roughly a, uh, an assembly area where the unit would assemble. And they, they was MPs posted about to get you through the beach so that you get uh, on a road and then you follow what, what map you had. And they, uh, we got to this field that night. I don't know, it must have been an hour later, six, seven o'clock. And that's when we heard all the artillery fire and uh, realized it, it wasn't going to be fun and games anymore. So. I don't know how much sleep we had that night, but the next morning, I remember uh, a sergeant from the uh, from the headquarters company came rounding people up and saying where we were going to start off, and that's the way everybody got together. It was, uh, it was I would say, considering. All the confusion which was going on at that time with, between units, and uh, it, it was pretty well organized. It was well planned. You know, everything didn't follow the plan, but uh, it, it was. It didn't take you long to get acclimated to to the situation. How did did you feel like? scared or nervous the whole time, or did you just kind of start going about your business? And, and oh, no, I, was I wasn't scared at that point. I would, I've been scared in this war, but I, at that stage I wasn't scared. I would, I guess I hadn't encountered the, uh, the real problems that we would see coming down the road. Mm -hmm. But uh, we filled in, at, at that time, I guess, we moved about another three, four miles inland and set up a line of defense. It was a, a railroad track that ran down a, a, almost like a culvert, a big deep culvert. And we sat on that until the uh, until they could build more troops to come into the beachhead. And uh, at that stage there was a, a lot of um, stormy weather going happening right there in the English Channel, and they couldn't get the boats in. So, and we were on K rations at that time, and had only what ammunition we could carry. So it was, 
uh, we just sat on that line, I would say almost a week, two weeks. With, uh, at that time, we were with the 1st Airborne, and uh, the 29th Division was right alongside us. And they, very soon, they, they pulled the 1st Airborne back off, off line and sent them back to England to make another jump sometime. And then we went, uh, we were attached to the 1st, I mean the 29th Division, which was part of the 1st Army. And uh, let's see, there was the 29th Division, the 30th Division, and 2nd Armored was uh, Corps troops. 19th Corps was with 1st Army. So we worked with those three divisions throughout the, the French campaign, I would say, through, uh, and I guess you've heard or read about hedgerow country. This part of France was all hedgerow country. I mean, it was, uh, and a hedgerow was an earth mound that acted like a fence around a farmer's field. So. The, the movement to get an army to advance, you had, they had complete cover as far as the enemy was concerned. And it was very difficult to advance because they were, had, they were totally protected and they had open fields of fire. And they had had many opportunities and a lot of time to plant mines in strategic crossroad sections places like that that were, uh, that had to be removed. Mm -hmm. So that the, uh, and this was the beginning, as far as uh, I remember it, we, I guess we, the first town I remember was Isigny, a little town on the French coast. And uh, you could see the French people uh, as we, came by sticking out American flags on the, on the staffs. You know. But the... Um, Did you meet any of the French people? Not at that time, no. Uh, you asked me to t talk about a, a personal... Uh, a, I can tell you this, uh, it's got a little humor to it. As I said earlier, we were on K-rations. and. In this stage, everybody was looking for a change of food. They hadn't, they hadn't brought sea rations in. I, I don't know if you're okay, rations, just a little square box. But <clears throat> so one, one night, the, uh, the captain said, we, we got, there were some cows in a field, farmers' cows, I mean French cows. And we thought we'd go get us a cow. And uh, so we went over in a weapons counter. We happened to have a, a GI that was a butcher in civilian life. So we went and got the cow and cut him up and made steaks and enjoyed it. We even sent some up to battalion. And about two or three days later, uh, this British uh, civil affairs, uh, he was a major, but uh, most of most of the British that were in our sector at that time were all civil affairs people who were, I guess, uh, trying to reestablish the French in their own little towns and so forth. So he, he came in, he's asking, he's wanting to know if we knew anything about killing a cow because the entrails and all that had been left out in the field. Well, no, we didn't know anything. And he finally called uh, the officers into a tent, and he left the Frenchman outside. And he says, I'm going to tell you. You see, at this stage, all of our vehicles were color-coded. You know, they didn't have the name of the unit on it. They just had maybe a, a blue or red or green bar on it that identified us to our own troops. But uh, the enemy couldn't tell what unit they were fighting or where they were from by the color code. So he, he proceeds to tell us that while we were doing all this with this cow, an 
ACAC unit, anti-aircraft unit, who had been accused of doing it, uh, had spotted this vehicle of ours and identified it with the color code. So the major said it's going to cost you, uh, I don't know, it was around $360 or something like that. It cost us about 60 bucks a piece. The five officers paid it. And that's, <laughs> that's a remembrance, you know. <laughs> so, it probably tasted great, though. <laughs> oh, it, it was great. It was great. But that's, uh, you know, that's part of the humor of... Uh, yeah. Now, you said there were, a lot of, there were mines out there. Were you involved with clearing the mines? Oh, yes. Or? Yeah. Uh, well, I can tell you a story. I... I I can't tell you exactly where in France this was, but this was somewhere uh, on the road to St. Lo. And <clears throat> you want me to hold this up? Yeah. Um, if you could, you turn it. Oh. Yeah. This was somewhere around St. Lo. Uh, I was sent out to clear a minefield. The, uh, the tanks had stopped. And uh, I had a, a platoon of men. We went out to clear the And we had had some prisoners at this stage of the game. So uh, I, I went out. And I, these tanks were all buttoned up. I mean, it, you know, the enemy was all around, although we weren't getting shot at. But I hit my rifle butt on the tank commander's tank to ask him, you know, where, where were the, the mines that, that he was talking about? Because he had radioed back. And he, he talked to me through that set gun he had on the turret. And I said, Lieutenant, if you want to talk to me, talk to me through here. Now, this is funny because we're standing out there. Nobody's shooting at us at this time. And he said, there's a minefield ahead, and we wanted to make sure. So we, we start looking to try to identify the pattern of, of the minefield. And when we did this, uh, another infantry unit came up with some uh, German prisoners. So we said, can we borrow those prisoners from us? Because we're going to have to get on our hands and knees and do uh, bayonet probing. Just Because our plan was to probe and identify uh, the locations. And then we would just blow a path for the tanks to go through. We're not try and, not try and pick up the mines or anything like that. But just, Make, just a disintegrate. Mm -hmm. But we put the Germans on their hands and knees with our bayonets to do the probing and said, look, you must know where these are. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So that's, that's just another uh, point in the war that I remember pretty vividly, only because it was so funny with this, with this tank lieutenant. But uh, we cleared it. The only, I guess, uh, a highlight was the, uh, my platoon was sent to the Versailles Palace to debooby trap the palace before uh, Ike's chief headquarters was going to move into this palace. Mm -hmm. right out, This is right outside of Paris. And uh, we went all through that palace. We didn't find the first booby trap. It was, it was a good assignment because it gave us a chance to uh, sneak into Paris, but the Germans had already vacated the city. Mm -hmm. But the French were very, we were probably one of the first few troops to get into Paris because of this. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the, you know, the French were all over the deep and we had to get out of there. 
Did you get to see much of Paris? Did you have any <laughs> any time to get around Paris? Uh, when we were in Germany, I had a a three day pass to Paris, and that's when I, I got to see a little bit of Paris. But it uh, it's uh, I have since been back to Paris, and of course I couldn't tell you where I went when in Paris when I was in the war. There was no uh, Moulin Rouge or anything like that going on, yeah. but it was, uh, it had, they had a hotel, I don't even recall the name of the hotel, but that was set up for like offices R&R, &R. and we just walked around and made most of the bars. So where, um, where did you go? Uh, we after. went, uh, after France. I guess we went into Belgium. Let's see. So you mostly then went through France and pretty much doing the same types of... Uh... Pretty much in support of, uh, of these infantry divisions. Uh, at one time, uh, I, you've read the history of the breakthrough when uh, we finally broke out of the hedgerow country of France. And the, uh, at that time, uh, First Army was still the, the front army in, in this particular sector. And they set up a group called uh, Combat Command A, which comprised of uh, a platoon of engineers, which was out of mine, and uh, a company of cavalry, which was the 113th Cavalry, and a battalion of infantry. And the, the mission at that time, at the breakthrough, was to maintain contact with the enemy so that we knew at all times where they were. We, and you, they kept probing for strength uh, so that they could just determine what tactics our forces would use to either envelop them or throw them head on. But we had, um, we had a couple of serious river crossings that uh, I happened to be participating in. And, uh, the Ruhr River crossing, which we crossed at Julik. tough river crossing and basically we sat on the Rua River for almost a week before attempting to cross because upstream were these huge dams and the, the thinking of, of our generals was that the minute we started to cross they would release the, all the water from these dams which would just wash whatever bridges or floating uh, tank, tank bridges and foot bridges, wash them down. So uh, after waiting so long, and I, uh, they decided that we, that the uh, 30th Infantry and 29th would jump off. So I, uh, I happened to be assigned a, as a reconnaissance officer and they went up in one of these small artillery spotted planes. We had to determine, since I was, my, my platoon had been assigned uh, building the footbridges that would cross the infantry. 
and we had to select the sites. And at that point in time, the Germans were just massed on the opposite side of the bank of the river and had just wide open fields of fire. So you couldn't, you couldn't go down and walk around on this side of the river without getting blown. You know? So they, uh, I went up in this artillery spotter plane with this pilot. And we flew up and down the river by Julik to uh, pick out bridge positions where we would launch. And you, you had to pick a position where you had good approach, uh, like at the a street section, mm -hmm. where you could bring troops down quickly and get them across quickly. And these footbridges, they, you assemble them on shore and you attach them and you push them out. It's, it's one section at a time. Mm -hmm. And you just keep pushing it across and pushing it across. And then when it, when it gets to the other side, you go and anchor it to the far side. Well, we built this bridge pretty much under fire. How long does this take to, to build a bridge like that? Across this river? Uh, I would say we did it in about an hour. Oh, wow. Oh, you move, you move. And, and it, it, it wasn't as wide a river as the Rhine. But, uh, and these things go together pretty fast because you're, you're assembling them behind some protection. And you carry, you're assembling each section behind some protection. And then you carry this up and you attach it on, and another group's assembling on, and you attach it on, and then, but it, it just keeps, once you get it to flow, it flows, and you just keep moving. And the minute you hit the other side, the infantry's starting to come across. And the, in the meantime, you've got artillery bombarding the far side of the river to, to chase them out. And, but the infantry builds that bridgehead as they funnel these men across and open them up and move it out. So then they, they build them the larger flo floating bridge to bring the tanks over. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the way you make a river crossing. I should say, prior to the footbridges going, you have infantry going across in assault boats. Mm -hmm. uh, you, they're running by outboard motors. And, you just, and it, that's the first protection you get for building a footbridge. They run a, maybe a platoon or a company of infantry across in your particular location. And they're building these uh, all the way down the river. I mean, we weren't the only platoon building footbridges. Mm -hmm. But that, uh, that was as tough a river crossing, I think, that uh, we, we had. And we, we crossed uh, a number of rivers, but none, none with as much fire, uh, firepower as they had against us at that time. And I think that uh, that probably was was part of uh, my getting the Brownstone, that action. Although it, the citation doesn't cite this, but uh, I think it helped. Whatever. I need to take a little drink of water. <laughs> sure. This is a resumption of the interview with uh, Mr. Golden. Uh, I'm, I'm going to back up and say, prior to the river crossing mm -hmm. at Julie, we had to go through the Siegfried Line. Uh, the infantry had already cleared the Siegfried Line, as far as uh, active pillboxes were concerned. But we had the, the mission to blow these pillboxes to eliminate them in, in case of any counteroffensive. So uh, I guess we spent several days blowing dynamite and pillboxes in the in Siegfried Line. And that, they were built uh, far, far 
more effectively and more efficiently than the French. The Maginot Line was the French line of defense, and the Siegfried Line was the German line of defense. <coughs> but the Siegfried Line was far superior to the Maginot Line. So after we went and uh, crossed the Julich, the next major river crossing we had was the Rhine. And uh, our company crossed the Rhine a little bit north of Dusseldorf. And it was, uh, you know, outside of every day being pretty much the same, uh, the war was like a it was the same every day. You just fought it, and it was just new ground until you, uh, until we reached the Elbe River at Magdeburg, where we met the Russians. I, I would say that uh, another very tough experience was when we were in in the winter in Hurtgen Forest, and this. The Germans had made a, a counteroffensive, and they, they had put a big bulge in our line. I don't know you've read the Battle of the Bulge. Well, this this is also when we were uh, attacking to pinch off that bulge so that we could surround the Germans and uh, defeat that army there. Well, this was in the heart of winter. Without a doubt, was the most miserable living that uh, I experienced in, in my time in the European theater. It, it was just miserable. It, you couldn't get warm. You couldn't dig a hole. The ground was so frozen, and you uh, you just stayed away from trees because the artillery shells would, would shatter so much. You know? But that. You talk about experiences, those, those are some of the uh, weird experiences. The only other experience I can tell you about is being assigned uh, in jumping off over a, a railroad. Uh, our, my platoon was sent to uh, take care of the explosives that the Germans had placed to use to blow this railroad bridge so that the, the tanks couldn't cross it. Well, fortunately, the, the infantry did get across it and was establishing some protection on this railroad bridge. And we, I was sent to lead these tanks because of the, they didn't know where they would be detonated. The explosives were there, they were all wired, but nobody knew if they would be detonated, uh, remote control, or somebody had a wire uh, four or five hundred yards away. Anyway. We, uh, we went there and found it, it didn't look like it was going to be detonated. We couldn't find anything leading away from the, the bridge, and the tanks crossed over. But it, it was one of these hairy incidents where you, when you say, have you ever been scared? I was real scared, very scared. Mm -hmm. And um, that was one of the times. Where was that? Uh, that was in Germany. Germany. The uh, the only other experience I can I, that might have of interest is when we met the Russians at Magdeburg. We stopped on the, at the Elbe River. That was our stopping point at the war. Right there, the Russians were on the other side of the Elbe River. That's where that's where the armies met. <coughs> I never dreamed it was such a ragtail army. I mean, there were horses and wagons, 
women. This is the Russian army. And at this stage, uh, the political factions were still headbutting. So on our side in Magdeburg, the Russians had control of the, the uh, electronic Anyway, the elect generating plants. They had control of the generating plants. and wouldn't give us any power on our side. And they wouldn't let us cross over that bridge. So it was, uh, you're meeting an ally, but he's not really an ally. So we both, we both posted guards on each side of the river. They couldn't come on our side, and we couldn't go on their side. And it stayed like that until they pulled us offline. How long, how long were you there like that? Oh, I'd say several weeks. And what did you do during that time? We rested. <laughs> we cleaned up and rested. You know, all this time you're talking about maybe getting a bath every two or three weeks. And how did you sleep? Could you sleep? Well, you slept on the ground. Just you know, on the ground. Just on the ground, yeah. But, uh, you get accustomed to that. You there know? You. Except, in, except in the winter. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, till this day, you couldn't, you couldn't take me to snow country. Or, I have no, no desires to go skiing. or uh, I just, I've seen all the snow I wanted to see. And it was, it's had a lasting effect on me. Uh, that part of it has anyway. Mm -hmm. I'm ashamed to say. So you, <clears throat> you you said you stayed there. I stayed there at, at uh, Magdeburg, and they pulled us back to a, a town in Germany called Bad Nauheim, mm -hmm. which was a, a a recuperating type city, and we got clean clothes and cleaned up, and we started drilling again. <laughs> and when approximately was this, too? Uh, must have been August. Yeah, August of 1945. Because, uh, July. Uh, it was a summer. Summer yeah, it's probably on the back of here. Oh, okay. The, the date yeah. uh, that we went to Bad Nauheim. Because from Bad Nauheim, uh, at this stage in the war, they started finding out how many points you had. So who would go home first? Mm -hmm. And with the experiences of I, that I had, I had sufficient points to go home. But then they started talking about who is needed for the Western Theater to go to Japan. And uh, with my experience throughout all this, they figured that I was, it was more important for me to take an assignment to go to Japan. So I was transferred to a unit in Marseille, France, to ship out. While I was in Marseille, it was only maybe a, a day before we were going to ship out, or two days before we were going to ship out. VJ Day was declared. You remember hearing what, where you were when you heard that? Oh. Uh, How you felt? <laughs> oh, I felt very good. <laughs> very good. Because, it, it, as it turned out, we were one of the first troops home. I mean, we were there at, at an embarkation point, and instead of that boat taking us to Japan, it just took us to the States. And that was, I guess I was in Marseille two or three weeks, and I bumped into uh, an old buddy of mine from LSU there. Really? Yeah. So did you... Uh... And we just hossed around. Good. Good. Um, can you tell me about the Bronze Star?
star metal that you got and the, um, the other metal? Uh, yeah, I've, I've got a copy of the commendation here okay, she's she's, that she has, but uh, I, I think it was uh, more for a, a general uh, performance. Performance, okay. It wasn't a specific. No, I, it wasn't a, a sp specific action. Mm -hmm. I think it was. I think it was just a, a multitude of things that uh, they liked the way I did it. You know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, that's as modest as I can say it. <laughs> so, from Marseille, did you come back? To the States then? Yes, ma'am. I came back to uh, uh, Hampton Roads, Virginia, Fort Patrick Henry. You remember seeing the United States? Oh, yes. I remember seeing the United States. And I remember when we, we got off that boat and they took us to these quarters and to the mess hall. The first thing they did was bring out half gallons of homogenized milk and, uh, and ice cream all the things you dream about. Mm -hmm. but it, uh, it, we were treated royally. Okay. And then, and then, did you go back home? Or uh, then I got. Out? They uh, put me on a troop train to Camp Shelby, Mississippi, right outside of Hattiesburg, to be discharged and uh, give you a final physical and make sure you're not bringing any vermin back to the states, you know. Uh, and from from Shelby, I went home. Mm -hmm. Caught a bus and went home. Um, and then what did you do once you got back? Once you got out of the service? And well, when I got, uh, I had 46 days of leave accumulated over the uh, time frame. And I started looking for a job. And uh, I thought maybe I could be a petroleum engineer somewhere, and so that's where I started to look. And I went to work, I got employed by a firm by the name of Lane Wells, who did uh, gamma ray logging and gun perforations, which means uh, when a hole is drilled and they want to bring oil into the pipe to pump it out, you, you've got to run a log down this drilling hole and determine the strata to, you know, what is oil sand, what is gas, so forth. And when you determine where the oil sand is, you run another bomb down, it's got armor piss and bullets, and from this truck, this is a mobile truck, mm -hmm. uh, it fires these electronic bullets which pierce the casing of the pipe so that this oil can seep through these perforations and be pumped to the surface. That's what this company did. And uh, I worked out in New Iberia, Louisiana. That, uh, that's where the job was. <clears throat> and quite honestly, uh, after living in the field for, for the better part of three years, I, the, doc, the job just didn't, didn't appeal to me. I, uh, it was put, put us on a barge. We were doing a lot of offshore work. Put us on a barge out of Morgan City, Louisiana, and take you out in the Gulf, and you'd sit on an oil rig until they could bring all that pipe out of the hole, which could be two, three days. And then you'd do your job. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and before you, before you would get all tooled out and loaded up, you'd get a, a phone call. And there's another well getting ready. So and so. And sometime I'd leave New Iberia with a, with a toothbrush and I'd get back for five days, six days. Sometime two weeks. So it, uh, I just decided I, I, I wasn't going to do that in the rest of my life. So I came back to uh, New Orleans and uh, got a job in a roofing plant as a, a foreman. And they sent me to Chicago because they bought a tile company to manufacture asphalt tile. And I went up to this company and was taught 
uh, all the rudiments of the manufacturing process and came back and opened a plant in New Orleans. And I stayed there for I decided I'm going to get in sales into the business. So I, I went to work for a, a competitor of theirs in the sales end of the business, selling asphalt tile, vinyl asbestos tile, cork tile, flooring materials mm -hmm. to contractors. And that's what I did until I got uh, promoted to Atlanta. 56, and I've been in Atlanta since 56, until I changed industries and got in the swimming pool industry and went to work for a swimming pool manufacturer. And I retired in 87. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, did you uh, keep in, you, the, the family that you met while you were in England, that you stayed with in England? Did, did you keep in touch with them? Yes, I people? did. We would write, uh, exchange pictures, and, uh, write letters, primarily at the, uh, at the Christmas season, until they died. Mm -hmm. Did you ever go back? Not while well, they were alive. Mm -hmm. But you have been back to Europe since then? I went back on a, um, a trip with American Express, one of these tour mm -hmm. trips. And we went uh, from from here to London, and in London to Holland, or Germany. It's, it's, Did you go back to Normandy or any no, other places? No, I'm, I'm sorry, we didn't go back to Normandy. Although uh, I've had friends that uh, they, they, it, it overwhelms them, uh, the cemeteries, because we had a lot of casualties. Did you? Yes. When you, when you had quite a number of casualties. Um, are, are you are you involved now in any uh, veterans groups, or do you, have you kept in touch with any people that you were in the war with? I uh, I kept in touch with Joe Burnt, who was one of the lieutenants in those pictures, and he came to Atlanta one time. Uh, I'm going back. We've never had a so-called company reunion or uh, battalion reunion. Uh, McInerney, who was captain of this company, uh, was out of Fairbanks, Alaska. And I, uh, I got a Christmas card from Mac, I guess, a couple of years, and it just people just scattered. That's the uh, only way I can explain it. Um, is there anything that that we didn't that you didn't talk about in your experiences that um, you'd like to uh, go back to? Uh, uh, I only wish my memory was better at this. <laughs> the no, I I think uh, that's about a, a feeling of what I did and uh, my experiences. I, uh, how do you feel? Do you feel like it's a, had an effect on the rest of your life? Oh, it yes, I think it had an effect on the rest of my life. Uh, I, I think I don't mind paying taxes living here. <laughs> the uh, you know you you just don't appreciate where you live and how you live uh, until you experience uh, this type of life. But I wouldn't have, I wouldn't swap it for. Her. It, uh, I think it uh, it made a man of me uh, pretty quickly, I believe. Uh, over there. and I think you grow up pretty quick. You know, I'm 21 years old as a lieutenant over there, with about 40 men telling them what to do, and it's. Uh, you just grab a hold of yourself real quick. Mm -hmm. And I think that that training and that background uh, with people has helped me throughout my business career. It's, 
uh, you get where you uh, you know how to organize people. You know to how to, uh, how to treat people. And I, I think that's. I think the army knows how to educate people. It, it might sound strange, but their their methods are uh, very structurally sound at, uh, in teaching you what they want you to learn. And I think they do an excellent job. And I think any young man that. Uh, serves in the army, will get something out of it, but on the positive side. Mm -hmm. That's my personal feeling. Well, thank you very much for well, the uh, interview and coming to the Atlanta History Center. You're quite welcome. I enjoyed it. <clears throat>